Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harini, for that uh, very interesting uh, uh, expose and critique of the state of the Sri Lankan state at this point in time and the need for a reversal of this uh, uh, narrative of uh, decline, as you call it. Okay, uh, Q&A time. Next half an hour to be devoted to it. Uh, uh, as your one is on, you'll ask questions. You will uh, identify yourself, uh, 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 make it a query, make it a comment. You might wish to address one of the panelists, or you might wish to address the podium generally. Uh, the floor is open. Uh, I recognize uh, Surya Narayana, Mr. Surya Narayan, ISAS. So question first to Professor Asim Sajjad Akhtar. You have indicated that right now the military in Pakistan is seeking once again monopoly of power through covert means. And we all know that in the post Ziaul Haq period of democracy for a few years, similar attempts were made through dismissals of elected quote unquote prime ministers. Do you see a difference between that particular trend and what you perceive as a potential threat to the system in Pakistan today? And a question to Dr. Harini, how is it that Sri Lanka has managed to have democracy, sustain democracy without any military intervention despite terrorist struggles against the state? Thank you. Um, I think there is a, a substantive difference and that's precisely the fact that uh, there isn't a unqualified constituency of support for um, you know, military rule, military intervention, that now even covert means or um, you know, attempts to manipulate the system are called out in that way. Um, that, that's a change, that's a shift. That's not to say that uh, the military will, doesn't, will stop trying. That's, that was my point. Um, and, you know, in some ways, you know, an institution with, that has enjoyed such power um, is, is in some ways actually a more dangerous when its power starts to wane um, because it gets more desperate. Um, and, and, and what's been going on the last three months is, 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 is as far as I understand, is, is, um, is, is as much about an act of desperation as anything else. Um, where uh, in, in quite an unprecedented fashion because, you know, if we take the Kadri individual out of the mix who's now taken himself out of the mix by going back to Canada, um, this, is not, this is not someone who's an outsider who's coming in and, and saying, I want to topple the system. This guy, Imran Khan, is in power in, in a province. He's in government. Um, instead of focusing on delivering where he's in power, he, he's saying, I want to, you know, create a, a brand new social political order where corruption will be banished in 90 days. So it, that is in, an element of desperation. But I also wanted to, which I didn't have a, a chance to get into at length, part of the point I was also making was that there are now different constituencies within Punjab that are, that are standing, are very polarized in this debate, right? So you have this commercial lower middle class that has historically been Nawaz Sharif's supporter, the trader, the merchant, the transporter. That element that was given uh, in some ways a Philip during the Zia regime um, and actually was, was, the, was, the, was, the, was the particular class force that toppled Bhutto in the PNA movement in 1977. It was traders and merchants. So these guys in Punjab are generally Muslim League supporters. But now there's another segment of, let's say, a middle class, which is sort of more metropolitan, uh, historically uh, relatively alienated from politics, which is coming out in a big way to say Imran Khan is the best thing that's happened since, I don't know, since the last military dictator or something like that, you know, the Messiah complex, sort of the, the perennial anti-politics middle class that supports a messiah who comes in and saves the day. So that, that's, a, that's a kind of polarization that actually Punjabi society has not witnessed uh, since I think 1977 in that sense where you know the, the lower orders, 
the, pr the proverbial workers and peasants were with Bhutto and the emergent middle class, commercial middle class was with Dhyaya. And then since then, there's been a relative consensus. And now, again, you see this happening. So I think that what I'm pointing out to is that there's polarization, that the military doesn't have a one singular political elite in Punjab to do its bidding. And it's sort of playing, trying to play them off against one another. Um, its monopoly in many senses is still intact, but I think at the level of, of discourse, there's at least now more, um, it's, there's, there's much more of a, there's much more dissent that can do the rounds. How substantive it is and whether it just focuses on individuals I, I, is a different matter. Um, but I, I still think that you cannot rule out uh, the military intervening in this, that way or the other because it, it still always has, especially with this terrorism card, you know, it still has an opportunity to uh, once in a while by launching an heroic operation against terrorists to depict itself as the savior and, 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 and sort of manipulate public opinion accordingly. I think that's the million dollar question. Uh, for the longest time, I think at least till the uh, mid early 1980s, the military in Sri Lanka was largely ceremonial. So it was only with, with the exacerbation of the conflict that you really see the military getting into a dominant place. And what happened since uh, about 2004 onwards is the massive increase in the military, in terms of simply in terms of numbers. And there have been scholars who've actually argued that uh, the military proved to be a kind of a source of employment for some of the sort of, you know, disenfranch disenfranchised uh, rural uh, single uh, male commu youth who would have otherwise been a sort of uh, posing another kind of threat to the, to the government. So since the war against the LTTE ended, what to do with this huge military has become a real concern. And you can see that since about 2010, the military becoming more and more engaged with sort of other kinds of uh, work uh, in providing sort of, you know, in the hospitality sector, in, in civil administration, in disaster relief, things which had been uh, the purview of the civilian administration for the, for the longest time. So there's still kind of uh, sort of you know the the the, the institutions that have be, that are in place are still fairly strong enough that the the, the there's been no sort of uh, real gap for the military to fill but i think what will happen in the in the months and weeks to come might really determine the kind of role that the military will play in sri lanka's future because it will be tested. Because this is a time when we are during peacetime and we are having such a huge military and where spending on the military has not decreased since the war ended. So what we're going to do with such a huge military in peacetime is, is, is a question that is still left to be answered. Uh, I'm a Prajata. I'm from India. I'm a master's in public policy student at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, my question was for Dr. Akhtar, and it's slightly controversial. I hope you take it in the right spirit. Uh, I, like, we are constantly taught to question assumptions like democracy as the best way forward for a particular country. And clearly from Pakistan, there are two narratives that emerge, like the military as the good guy who knows to do things better than the, the democratic uh, institutions, and the military as anti-democratic and as the bad guy. But clearly, like, uh, the last 60 years have seen that there has been this constant uh, pursuing of democracy as, um, as an end in itself, because it should be pursued for certain outcomes. And clearly the Musharraf regime did show that it had good economic growth. So is it uh, time that Pakistan stops pursuing this and in a way institutionalizes the centrality of the military because it's doing much more damage? Because at one level you say you are a democracy, but at the same level your military can come and kind of topple the government anytime. So there's this complete erosion of faith. So possibly like a reform which centralizes that to get things in order and do an incremental thing rather than this uh, pursue of democracy when Pakistan is clearly not prepared for. So my name is Anil, I'm Singaporean, and I'm a psychology major from James Cook University. I'm also the son of a marriage between a Hindu Indian father and a Buddhist Sinhalese mother. So you could say that I'm actually a bit of a child of the region. 
Now, in June 2013, the UK's Home Secretary announced that the UK would require some applicants for some visas from up to six countries to pay security bonds of up to £3,000 right, when applying for a visa to be returned to the holder after they left the UK. Now, those countries uh, to be included in this were India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, and Ghana. Now, though that proposal you know, event was eventually uh, dismissed in November, it highlights a very significant outflow of people from, these, from, from the mentioned regions. Yeah. So towards countries like the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, even Western Europe, Russia, not excluding countries like Malaysia and Singapore. And this group of people are not just the wealthy, but they're actually made up by people from different areas of the socioeconomic spectrum. Now, do you acknowledge that this is a major problem or simply an effect of a country's globalization? And two, considering that this is the same group that may very well be listening to you right now, how would you, as ambassadors of the uh, educated community, tell them that we know it's hard, but please stay and help your country grow? Look, I think that uh, you make a very good point. Actually, the vast majority of migration that takes place, I, I can only speak about Pakistan, is actually not affluent people, is not very educated professionals, um, even though dotted across the world, you'll find, you know, sort of groupings of educated professionals, like, for example, Pakistani doctors in North America, you know, have influence well beyond their numbers. Um, they, 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 some people might even say they can make and break governments. Um, like with Musharraf, you know, they had, it was remarkable how influential those doctors were. But Aside from that, the vast majority are working class populations and they've been going abroad for donkey's years. It's not very recent. Um, in Pakistan's case, uh, there was a huge outflow uh, under the Bhutto regime to the Gulf uh, and that has had an enormous impact on Pakistani society on numerous fronts. Remittances is the obvious thing that we think but also in terms of the Wahhabi ideas that those folks brought back home. Um, uh, and the fact that every time they show up, they they want to build a Wahhabi mosque and and in and uh, and uh, in migrate a Wahhabi imam uh, into their villages. I don't think you're going to stop them. I don't think I would even suggest that one would want to stop them until and unless there is a socio-economic order within your own society that doesn't push them out um, and force them to go looking abroad. Um, if you're talking about the affluent, sort of the classic brain drain question, that's a different issue. Um, um, that's, that's, a, that's an entirely different kettle of fish because in, in most cases, uh, educated, especially English educated, relatively well-off folks don't come home and they're not interested in coming home and they don't have any great uh, incentive to do so. They don't have any sense of public service, for example, that motivates them. So I, I doubt I'm the right person to convince them to come home, um, except that you know if they, except for the fact that you know obviously uh, the obvious appeal, which is that they're needed. But on in both on both accounts for different reasons, I think it's actually difficult to expect that that trend will will discontinue. The the question about democracy. Look, I actually um, at a th at, the, at the level of theory and philosophy, I actually have. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical of, of, of contemporary democratic models, neoliberal democratic models in which I think choice is very limited uh, in, on many fronts. But Pakistan is a different s story in many ways. I mean, for us, any kind of basic liberal democratic uh, institutions represents a step forward. Now, where, I, where I'd actually disagree with you is that Pakistan is not ready for democracy. Ayub Khan in 1958 said, we can't have democracy because it doesn't suit our weather. Um, and then at various points, democracy doesn't suit Islam. You know, this is a very popular lay person's argument as well. In fact, there was the cl actually not even lay person, you know, Sam Huntington in 1968, you know, sort of eulogized Ayubian uh, sort of basic democratic, which is basically a centralized authoritarian model, saying this is the way forward for all third world countries. So I, there's, there's a politics going on there. What I've actually tried to suggest to you today is, um, and, and I don't want to exclude Punjab from the mix, within Punjab, even if not a wide cross-section, 
definitely within the rest of the provinces, that is what people want. They want real democracy and real federalism. They don't want to be subjected to tyranny and military rulers and, you know, uh, a political elite that is... And, and that's sort of the problem. Many of our political parties are essentially not autonomous of the military, right? There's sort of... There's a state, the unelected state apparatus, and then there's these political parties. And, and the, the lack of autonomy of the parties is the problem. Democracy, for me, isn't the problem. We can agree or disagree about the kind of democracy it should be, you know, and that's a larger question about globalization and so on. But I don't think this is, as far as institutionalizing the military's role, well, it has been, right, for so long. I mean, these are all these constitutional amendments. Ziaul Haq had an amendment, the Eighth Amendment, which basically he tried to make Pakistan into some kind of presidential form and said the president can do anything whenever he feels like it. He can dissolve the assemblies, he can dissolve the Supreme Court, he can do this, he can do that. That was, in effect, a military way of institution. Now, you could have a Turkey, which is sort of a, a willing, voluntary retreat, where you institutionalize, as you say, their, their interests, their corporate interests in particular. In many ways, that already happens. Most elected governments in Pakistan don't step on the toes of a defense housing authority or a barrier town, which are all basically military initiatives to fill their pockets, essentially, uh, military personnel who get allocated cheap lands, you know, sort of develop it and then sell it off for 20 times the price. So I don't really know how much more institutionalization of the military's interests can be done in this country beyond just saying, okay, well, you really rule it, so just take it over. I mean, that's, and which is what happens from time to time anyway. So I think that there needs to be a pushback. Uh, and part of it is by demonstrating that large parts of the population, um, the, the, the provinces, want a democratic order. Uh, and so it's not just a pipe dream that a few people in the intelligentsia are calling for, but is actually uh, a genuinely popular demand. I am not sure whether I have to work too hard to get people like you back to Sri Lanka. My concern would be more with trying to stop the youth and the young people in Sri Lanka from leaving. Uh, because I think if you come, I mean, while I was having tea, so many uh, people came up to me and said, you know, what a one beautiful country Sri Lanka is. We've had such a good holiday there recently, you know. And, and if you come, come to Sri Lanka in around November, December, you would see the number of uh, diaspora who've returned to have a good time. For me, the most serious question is, why are the youth who are bo living in Sri Lanka right now so desperate to get out? I think that's a question that really needs to be asked and seriously considered. So again, there's, there is a sort of a, a real kind of difference in the way that a particular section of Sri, uh, uh, youth enjoy Sri Lanka. The, it's very different how the, the youth like you come back and experience Sri Lanka and how Sri Lankan youth themselves who are living there experience Sri Lanka. And I think there's something fundamentally wrong in that, in that the, those who, who, who have been left behind, who probably not had the opportunity to leave, are sort of fighting to get out. And they're risking their lives and limbs getting onto, you know, ra rackety old uh, boats and taking off in all kinds of ways. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, my, my dilemma is about making sure that, you know, uh, is trying to answer why they want to get out so desperately. I'd like to react to two, uh, two or three things what is, uh, has been said uh, uh, just now. Uh, one is the question of, of migration. There are people like Dr. Mizan, uh, Mizan here who has done a, a considerable academic work on, on why migrations happen. Uh, uh, Niaz referred to our period in government when, when I was in the cabinet. Uh, one of my other portfolios, apart from foreign affairs, was what we called overseas employment. It was my task, as a matter of fact, to seek employment for Bangladeshis abroad. And one of the successes he referred to, or he did not refer to, but referred to some successes of our government, was the fact that during our time we were able to obtain employment for 1.8 
million people abroad. So it was a matter of policy for the government of, Pakistan, of Bangladesh, as is for the government of Pakistan and also the other governments, including India and Sri Lanka and Nepal, to seek employment for their people abroad, for the remittances and for other, other, other reasons uh, as, as well. Yeah, that is true. That is, uh, labor is the biggest export. Uh, there were other reasons for migration, of course. There was the tenuous connection with the land. Uh, there was exploitation by Chaudhrys and in areas where 1793 Act did not apply, Mirpur in Pakistan, Silet in ba Bangladesh, etc. The other point about, uh, uh, about the military, in, uh, as you will recall, in 1958, there was this famous Dosso versus state uh, 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 judgment by Justice Munir, Justice Munir, which in essence uh, said that if a group of people were to uh, uh, occupy power and with the tacit co consent of the population for a period of six months, that takeover is justified. Uh, this judgment, Dosso versus state judgment, has been cited quite often. It's not done anymore, but in, in Africa and, 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 and many, many other countries. One of the reasons why the man on horseback uh, is sometimes credited with uh, uh, certain uh, positive elements, I mean, is because in societies that are not necessarily very democratic and still very feudal, it is thought that the military sometimes, like the civil bureaucracy also represents, more or less the man on what we call the clap of omnibus. I mean, the person who is not a zamindar, not a landlord, uh, you know, he is uh, one of the people. And therefore, if the otherwise the system is not more democratic, people do not uh, react so adversely to uh, elements within society who are organized to coming into power. Sometimes you will see that such transitions are hailed. And the last point I wish to make about, uh, about the difference between uh, uh, Niaz that you asked earlier on about judiciary and in, in, uh, uh, Bangladesh and India. You see, uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, in, in systems that are unions of, uh, of federations, judiciary has an additional responsibility because the judiciary protects the rights of the states as well. In unitary systems uh, like ours, uh, the judiciary does not have that responsibility and where executive tends to become more powerful, though historically, Judiciary has had a his history of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of judicial interventions, both in Pakistan and, and Bangladesh politically. Anyway, floor is still open. Uh, we have still some more time. And yes, sir, in the back. Um, I really found this session very interesting because it talks about real politics. It doesn't talk about designing public institutions because as social scientists of South Asia, we realize that however perfectly you design public institution, it doesn't really work that way at the real political level. Real political level is very different, and I'm happy that this session actually points it out. Um, my question is uh, to Niaz Bhai, because nobody is raising critical questions about Bangladesh, which I think is undergoing a very important transition at the moment. And this question is about two different things that you were talking about, that failure of decentralization at one level. And the other thing was, uh, you were talking about this uh, Shiraj Ganj project, which was a case of success. Now, um, I, I'm just curious to know about the reasons, you know, I mean, for, for this so-called failure. Is it because Bangladesh politics is so acutely bipolar? that it's impossible for the ruling regime, whichever it is, to devolve power, because then the likelihood of losing the grip over the localities, the chances, the risks are very high. Is it the case or is it something else? Secondly, you know, of late we have been hearing, and I think quite correctly, that in terms of human development indices, performance of Bangladesh is definitely better than India. Uh, in in uh, women's literacy, in uh, uh, women's uh, mortality rate, and so on and so forth. And this has been commented upon variously, from United Nations to Amartya Sen, etc., etc. 
No, I was just wondering that is it, and, and people say that this is happening because of local level participation of different actors. Now, if you are talking about lack of decentralization, real decentralization in Bangladesh, then are these local actors mostly the NGOs or there are government actors as well? Then how come that we match this performance in HDI with the lack of decentralization that you are talking about? I'm Ayesha and I'm a lawyer from Sri Lanka. And my question is for Dr. Amar Surya. Uh, as you most correctly pointed out, I think Sri Lanka's military will be really tested in the coming months. And with the growing unpopularity of the Rajapaksa regime, there is a high tendency that he will be losing the presidential elections, provided there will be free and fair elections, of course. And uh, there is a big fear of yet a risk of facing Sri Lanka's first military coup. If at all that takes place, how do you think Sri Lanka will survive? And with Sri Lankan government's relations with China, will India allow this? And will there be an international intervention? Could you please explain me on that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, brother. This is uh, truly uh, an important uh, issue and question you're raising. I don't have a clear answer to this. Um, Bangladesh's relative success in social development doesn't always equate with democratic practices. Let me just put it uh, straight. Now, we have got, as you have very rightly said, some fairly efficient activist-like organizations, including some of the NGOs, not the bulk of them, but in some NGOs. We also have fairly efficient project-based operation, sometimes done by regular government bureaucracy, but with significant results in social development in terms of, for example, uh, primary education. Uh, happening at the rural level. Now, these projects do not always mean they are participatory, but they are producing results. So we have this fair amount of paradoxes which make generalizations difficult. Now, the other point I would make is that we now have not just one broad type of um, institution or intervention actually producing these relatively encouraging results. We have got multiplicity of organizations and actors now. Now, for example, there is now a degree of social entrepreneurship coming out, even at the local level. Now, it doesn't mean that they are all democratic. So I don't see a direct link between democracy, uh, the, the classical uh, explanation of democracy, and Bangladesh performing relatively better in some of the so social indices, especially in terms of projectized development. So that's just a quick uh, point I wanted to make. Um, and the other thing which you said about NGOs. Now, again, NGOs come in all different shapes and sizes in Bangladesh. The difference between some of the NGOs and even large government organizations um, is also um, a fine line. For example, BRAC as such, is uh, almost, uh, you know, put rather bluntly, a parallel government. So um, I don't have straightforward answers to this, and I think these remain some of those, you know, famous paradoxes for which Bangladesh is famous. Um, but you know, thank you for raising this. I would like to hear more from you and from the panel about this.
Uh, yeah, I think that was a question designed to put me into trouble. <laughs> um, you know, I have sort of, you know, in, in, when you're living and when you study about Sri Lanka, one of the things you learn to uh, uh, appreciate is that you can never predict what's going to happen. Uh, in Sri Lanka, there's always like a crisis about to happen and it sort of somehow, you know, you turn a corner and something else happens. So, um, will there be a military coup with the way things are going? I sincerely hope not. Uh, but I, I think I, there's, there's, if, you, if you really look at what's happening now and the kind of way in which uh, the, the dissent and the resistance is kind of uh, being articulated, in, in many ways it shows that dem despite what is going on and appearances, democratic impulses are very strong still within Sri Lanka, despite you know, years of violence and sort of decades of kind of this push towards centralization and authoritarianism, not just with this regime, but you know, ever since the 70s. And somehow, you know, we, the, the, things have not got to that point yet. I think the worrying factor now, right, is, is, the, is, is the fact that like uh, what, has been, what, is hap what has happened in Pakistan, the involvement of the military in decidedly non-military activities. And um, they have much more investment in maintaining a regime that supports that, that, kind, that level of military involvement in, in all aspects of people's lives. That is the thing that has changed in the last uh, few years or so. so uh, it's 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 hard to say how how what would happen if in a in an uh, election uh, the 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 current government actually loses whether the, the that would mean whether that the military steps in I I I really don't see that happening because I think the sort of uh, uh, the the the, the the sort of democratic environment, whatever said and done, I mean, people, people, would, people would not like that at all. You know, so even, even when you talk, you know, that, that fear, uh, I, I don't think any, any political leader would want to be associated with something like that. Um, so, all I can say is let's wait and see. Uh, is, uh, as you'd know, in Calcutta in the 19th century, there was the evolution of a, 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 not a class, not a Marxian class in the sense that they were not related to processes of production, but they were a Weberian status group, the Bhadralok. Bhadralok literally translated means the middle class. They are Protestants uh, in, 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 their, in their religion in that sense. Uh, they behaved uh, differently from the common run of the, uh, of the other populations. Uh, they were accused of being toadies of the Raj, but that's another matter. What had happened in, in Bengal is probably there was a morphing of this uh, uh, Bhadralok into what we, we call the new Bhadralok, and uh, which was the uh, progenitor in some ways of, of the uh, NGOs in Bangladesh, in many ways that found fruition in, in, in uh, Grameen and Brack and, and, and Asha, etc., who stepped in where, where government uh, either did not succeed or did not want to, uh, which also made for some kind of a pluralism in society, despite uh, absence in many ways of certain democratic institutions and, uh, and norms. So uh, somehow the entire societal system was able to muddle through in a broad sense uh, democratically. Anyway, uh, we now have to bring our, uh, 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 our timekeepers uh, about whose efficiency I had made a comment earlier, uh, has, have been relentless in <laughs> urging me to bring this to a close, and, uh, which I shall, but not before I say what an interesting and incredibly rich uh, discussion this has been. Uh, and thank you, uh, 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 speakers, panelists, and audience for your participation. Uh, normally, when we come to a seminar of this type, uh, we come probably a bit confused. Uh, we f think it's a success when we go away, uh, still confused, but at a higher intellectual level, <laughs> which, which we are. Uh, anyway, uh, we will... Uh, uh, nation building, of course, in none of these countries that we've talked about today uh, has been easy, will not be easy. Uh, I, I lived for some years in, in, in Geneva, and there, uh, uh, the great son of Geneva, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, had said that uh, uh, the man who discovered state was the man who stood on a piece of land and said, uh, 
this land is mine and no one laughed at him. Uh, uh, and that is when the state began. And we and some of these states in Bangladesh, in, in, in South Asia, are still at that stage where, where, where nations are uh, at the very initial stages of, 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 of formation. It's not an e easy exercise, uh, uh, but still this, this has to be uh, gone, gone through. And uh, uh, I think there is a Chinese uh, saying that, uh, uh, friends, uh, there is no path. A path is made by walking. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your participation.